much. Let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to the book of 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, as we continue thir- through this particular epistle, epistle dedicated to fortifying the believer against internal stress, internal pressures uh, that may arise. And he begins, of course, by anchoring the believer in a very positive motion, spiritual growth, spiritual growth, being able to take what we have by way of our simple faith in Jesus Christ and building upon that simple faith so that we have a spiritual momentum moving forward. Uh, and so we have looked at that already. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we spent some time in the early part of chapter 1, and we saw what we might call the ladder of spiritual growth. And there were certain things that Peter was enjoining his readers to do uh, to add to, or supplement their faith. Now, when I say supplement, it's not dealing with trying to make them more saved. They're already saved. They have a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But as Christians, once we have come to the Lord, we're not to be stagnant. We're not to just be static and holding our place, but to move forward and grow in this new life. And the Lord has made it possible for that to happen. And so Peter lays that out for his readers in the early part of chapter 1. And then he gives a guarantee. After after he has laid out the ladder of spiritual growth, and he has encouraged the readers to be able to add to their faith, and we have a list of things that he was talking about there and explains them very carefully. Uh, He goes on to say there's a guarantee that comes with this. When you implement the counsel that he gives, the spiritual advice that he gives, there are two things that are going to be true in your Christian life. And that's where we're going to pick up here Uh, this evening so if you're there and you could stand with me please as we begin to read in verse 8 but I I think what we're going to do here is uh, because the passage is not necessarily that long uh, let's go ahead and begin in verse 5 in verse 5 we have the ladder of spiritual growth given to us he says and beside this giving all diligence add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity or love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless the time that we spend in the Word of the Lord. And pray, Father, that you would um, indeed encourage us to be able to walk according to your principles and according to the pattern that you have given to us in following in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord God, that we would be encouraged uh, by our time here this evening. Father, for those that are struggling with uh personal battles i pray father that you would fortify them by your spirit encourage them this week may they find joy in the lord jesus christ in a peace that passes understanding father for those that have family and relatives that do not have eternal life i pray that you would make them a glowing light and evangelist uh before their very eyes and lord god that they would be entreated Uh, on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ to come in faith. And Father, we pray all of these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, As I mentioned, we just read the passage there with the ladder of spiritual growth. And Paul or Peter then gives a guarantee. He says, if these things are there, there's going to be at least two things that will be realized in your life. Uh, The first... The first is that you are going to enjoy a 
vibrant life. In verse 8, he says, If these things be in you and abound, they shall make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is saying that as a Christian, your life is going to be buoyant. It is going to be evident that something is going on in your life and there is going to be a vibrance, a spiritual fruitfulness that is going to be true in your life. When we look back at the point of our salvation, we say, this is when I was saved. For some of us, we were very young. Uh, I was seven years of age, and not a whole lot of changes took place in my life when I was seven years of age. I didn't have a whole lot of bad habits that I had to get rid of, not a whole lot of things that I needed to jettison in my life. I was pretty much under the control and guidance of my parents, and they were very careful to guide me in the right path, and so I praise God for that. But as I began to grow, began to understand uh, what it was to be a Christian, uh, it was important for me to follow in the steps of my parents and to listen very carefully to the leading of the Holy Spirit that he would impact my life, that these things that Paul Peter has already listed would begin to show themselves in my life. And so that when I would look back, I'd say, okay, I am not the same today that I was yesterday. There are some changes and some differences in my life. I can see those things. I can see that there is fruit that is abounded both within my own spirit. That would be the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, generous goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These things are showing themselves in my life because I have the soil, the, uh, the, the nutri nutritive soil of the Spirit of God using the Scriptures to grow these things within, but also seeing an external fruit. In other words, seeing lives touched by my own testimony, uh, my witness, being able to say that there are those that are coming to Christ as a result of my witness. I can see that fruit. I can see that there's a result, resulting fruitfulness because of my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter says, this is what you're going to need. Now, he's just beginning. There's only three chapters in this epistle. And this epistle is dedicated to preparing the believers to resist problems from inside. And they can be the most insidious. Uh, we, we expect challenges on the outside. But sometimes we get caught off guard by challenges from the inside. And he says, if, if we're going to withstand that, it's going to be necessary to anchor yourself and, and have momentum spiritually. Spiritual growth moving forward so that you can maintain your balance. When I was learning to ride a bike, what, what we were teaching our children. I don't remember much about myself learning to ride a bike. My father may remember. Um, I just know that I learned how. But when, I was, when Sharon and I were raising our children, we wanted to teach them how to ride a bike too. And when you're teaching your child how to ride a bike, you don't you don't put them on the bike and have the kickstand down and say, okay, uh, just, just learn to steer. And, and, and once you get the steering down, okay, good, we can take the kick, we can kick the kickstand out, and you've, you've learned how to ride a bike. Uh, nor was it where I would just hold them and wobble it a little bit. No, we actually had to do a scary thing. You had to move the bike. You had to actually keep the momentum because a bike will not. I know that there's some crazy people that are able to, very talented people, I should put it that way, very talented people that can keep that bike stable without pedaling it. And, and there's even more crazy people that do the unicycle. My roommate, missionary to the Navajo, best friend of Bible college, he could ride a unicycle. He tried to teach me how to ride a unicycle. He brought it to college. And he tried to teach me and everybody in the dormitory, would you please stop? Because, you know, I would be going down the hallway trying to keep the walls, you know, and a boom, fall down and get back on. Boom, fall down. It would echo throughout this old, old building, you know. So would you please stop? You're, you're never going to learn. Just, just stop. But Ken would tell me a lot of it has to do with movement. You can't just sit still. You have to keep the pedals moving so that you can maintain your balance. In the same way with the bicycle. You have to keep moving to maintain your balance. And as a Christian, if we are not moving, we are not going to maintain spiritual equilibrium. We are going to fall one way or another. And so Peter says you, you, we meet, need to move forward 
demonstrate that fruit is abounding in your life, the Holy Spirit's going to produce that. You don't have to. You know, a tree doesn't think about growing fruit. It happens automatically. God has programmed the tree to do that. Uh, the tree doesn't sit there and say, okay, I'm going to try and produce an apple. No, it just, the, the Lord has designed the tree to work in such a way with, through photosynthesis and all the other intheses, and uh, you know, it just develops the leaves and the fruit begins to come. It doesn't have to think about it. It doesn't have to process it. It happens naturally. Well, for the Christian, it happens spiritually. Holy Spirit, when He is given free reign in my life, will produce that fruit. You don't even have to think about it. It happens. And that's what Peter is encouraging. He says, when these things are in your life, there's going to be a vibrancy there. But also, there's another guarantee. The second guarantee is found for us in verses 10 and 11. He says, wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence and make your calling and election sure. And just by way of clarification, he's not saying here you need to make sure that you're saved. The word sure there refers to that which is stable, that which is fixed, that which is firm. He's saying make sure by this, when you, when you allow these things to be true in your life, you will be stabilizing yourself spiritually. You will be taking that salvation that you have. He's assuming they have faith. He's writing to Christians. There's no, no question here. No equivocation. He says... When you allow these things to be true in your life, you are going to be firmly establishing and fixing in your own mind that you have been called and elected by God. You know, when, one of the things that I run into, I run into it in my own life when I was younger, one of the things that I run into all the time are Christians who say, I'm not sure I'm saved. Now, I never assume that they are. I begin with the assumption that they are not, that the Holy Spirit is convicting them. So I begin to ask questions. But when I come to the conclusion, based upon their testimony, that they are saved, that indeed they have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I have to look elsewhere. The culprit, 99 times out of 100, is sinful habit patterns in their life that have stunted their spiritual growth. They have ceased to grow and because they have ceased to grow by quenching the spirit the spirit provides that spiritual sap that enables us to grow spiritually by quenching the spirit they stop growing and when they no longer are growing they begin to look around and say what's wrong with me why am i not growing i don't have the evidence of my christianity in my life and they begin to question whether they truly are a christian you know if you come across a tree that is an apple tree, but that apple tree never, ever, ever produces apples, you have cause to ask, you know, is that really an apple tree? It calls it, they call it an apple tree, but I've never gotten one apple off that tree. And that's often what happens in the life of a Christian who is a genuine believer but has ceased to grow, maybe the fruit now has withered and they are no longer producing fruit. And then they ask themselves, well, am I really a Christian? And so Paul, Peter says, listen, make that calling and election a fixed point in your life. Fix it firmly in your mind that you are a child of God, that this calling of the Spirit, that this election by the Lord Jesus Christ is genuine and real. That's what he's referring to. You're not making yourself more saved. He's saying you are affirming that you are saved. That you are saved. But he goes on and he says, make that calling election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Now, the word in here is using is fall, is to fall and not get up. We all are going to fall. When you ride a bike, you are going to fall. That's just the nature of learning to ride a bike. But as you maintain the balance and you get more adept at riding that bike, you, your falls become fewer and fewer in between. And you make greater progress. Now, that doesn't guarantee you will not fall in future. We had a young people, young, uh, a single adult activity 
when my wife and I were back in Virginia, and one of them was a, a biking activity, or it included some biking. A lot of the guys and gals brought their bikes. And, uh, and so it was a picnic and all sorts of fun stuff, and, and uh, we were having a good time. And I know some of the, the uh, seagulls had not gotten back off the bike path, so I jumped on uh, a speedster. It wasn't mine. It was another one. And I was just going to take off, and so I was just pedaling like crazy, and I lost control. And I crashed and burned. I was thankful I didn't destroy the guy's bike. I, I took the front of it. Uh, uh, so you're going to still fall. You're going to get ahead of yourself. You're going to speed perhaps ahead of the Lord. Maybe you're going to lag. But falls are going to happen. But the phrase that he's referring to, you shall never fall, is the idea that you will never, you will never fall away. You will never completely become a loss. You'll fall. You'll get back up again. He uses the same concept when he's talking about Israel in chapter 11 of Romans. He says, have they... Have they uh, uh, fallen away, they never come back. He's, no, no, no. They have fallen, but they're going to rise. Israel's going to rise again. It's not that they have been fully rejected. So that's the kind of concept that he's talking about here. And then he goes on the very next verse. The very next verse, and he says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The second thing that he's guaranteeing, one is the vibrant, vibrant life, but the second is the victorious entrance. A victorious entrance into the, uh, uh, the presence of the Lord. He says, you are going to find that as you then come into his presence, when he calls you home, uh, you will come with confidence, you will come with uh, joy, you will come with praise, as opposed to being ashamed and embarrassed because you have not lived for the Lord Jesus Christ as you should have. Uh, he says, if these things are there, if you are growing spiritually, you will have nothing to fear when Jesus Christ says, now's your time. Whether it is in death or whether it is at the rapture, you will be ready. I found in my own life, and I found it true in the lives of other Christians, that those who do not grow spiritually are the ones that are most fearful of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they just don't like to talk about it because they know that if he were to come back today, they would not be, be very happy. It would not be a good reunion because they would know that, boy, I have not lived as I should have lived. Uh, we can all identify with that. We can all identify with that. Growing up as a kid, uh, there were times that I would be doing things. It wasn't very often, not because I didn't have it in me, but because my mother in particular, she, she was on it. And she knew, either it was on my face or whatever, she knew when I was not doing what I should do. But every now and then, there are times I'd be doing something and I, I did not want my parents to walk in that door. I did not want them... Walk. <clears throat> I remember we were, when I was uh, a young person, we were in, um, in California at Scott Memorial Baptist Church. And I had a friend, you might call him a friend. He was okay, but he would sometimes encourage me to do things I probably shouldn't do. And one time he persuaded me to uh, play hooky from Sunday school. And to, you know, we went in and we went back out again. And he said, well, let's go to the, uh, the auditorium. You know, go to the adult, you know. Wouldn't you know it? My parents never sat in the, in the balcony. We were going to go in the balcony, but that one day they sat in the balcony. And I remember going up, I don't know if you remember that or not, we remember going up with my friend, and all of a sudden this hand reaches out. <laughs> Oops, you've been had. You've been had. They caught you. You know, you, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, that is the Lord reaching out, saying, hey, are, are you ready to come home? Are you ready to come home? So the guarantee he gives is a vibrant life. It's going to be producing fruit. There's going to be uh, forward momentum and progress spiritually. We're going to see those things. And then there's going to be this sense of victorious uh, end, uh, entrance into the presence of the Lord. But, but Peter then gives in between there a caution. He says, now if these things are not there, there's something else that you have to be aware of. And it's really it's two things, and they go together. There's a spiritual blindness, or we might say, and he even alludes to it, a, a nearsightedness. 
and a forgetfulness. Let's take a look in our passage here. He says in verse 9, but he that lacketh these things, the, the, the believer that doesn't, and again, I, I'm basing this upon the assumption, and, and I think it's a contextual truth. That he's writing, he's still writing to Christians. He hasn't changed the subject. Because we know these things are not going to be true in a lost person. You don't expect it. So he's writing to Christians, and he still is writing to Christians. He said, the Christian who lacks these things, if he is not growing, if that latter spiritual growth is not there, he is blind spiritually. Now he qualifies it, I think, by saying he cannot see afar off. So he's not saying that he's completely blind, because if that were the truth, then the Spirit of God would not be in him. When the Spirit of God comes within us, we are able to see. But when we quench the Spirit of God, our vision, spiritual vision, becomes dim and we cannot see afar off. We cannot see beyond the here and now. We're just kind of fixating on this life. This is what's important to me. We're forgetting completely what's coming. And that's what he says next. He says, and he's forget, forgotten. He's been purged from his old sins. He's forgotten that God has washed him clean, that he has had his life washed with the blood of the Lamb, that he is white as snow in God's eyes, and he's forgotten that truth. He's allowed himself to slip back into his old ways and tarnish and taint himself. I ran home, and I was still in my, uh, my uh, dress outfit. And I said, John, I'll, I'll just do a couple dishes here to help you out a little bit and rinse a few things. He says, what are you doing that in your shirt, your, your dress shirt for? You're going to splatter something on your dress shirt. Duh. Right? Right? And as Christians, we have the white garments that we have from Christ, but we play in the mud. We play in the world. And we get smears and smudges on it. I'm notorious for that. My wife is always... You know, she says, if you're going to help, hey, maybe you can help clean, clean this up, change your clothes. And I said, I'll, I'll be all right. I won't, I won't get anything. Sure enough, I do. I always do. I always do. And as Christians said, oh, I'll be okay. I can play with this. I, I can, I can, it won't really bother me that bad. I can dip into this sin. I can kind of fudge a little bit here, live for the world a little bit. It's not going to leave a mark. I'll be all right. And sure enough, be sure your sins will find you out. Yes, we'll leave a mark. He says, when, when these things are not there, you become spiritually nearsighted. You are not getting the big picture. You are not seeing things the way God intended for you to see things. As a Christian, we have this eternal vision that the lost cannot they don't have. They don't have the capacity for it. They can anticipate what they envision the future to be like, but they, there's no, it's not based on reality. It's based upon their imagination, what they think, you know, uh, or utopia or heaven or, you know, extinction might be. They're anticipating, but they have no real basis for what they're believing. But as a Christian, I can. I can say, wait a minute, I know what's on the other side. I know what's coming next. I have my Bible that tells me these things. It's, it's right here, right in front of me. I can see these things. I know what's coming on. <clears throat> the Apostle Peter says, if you don't have these things in you growing, you're not growing physically, spiritually rather, you're not growing spiritually, you are going to be limited in what you can truly see spiritually. The rest of it's going to be a fog spiritually because it's clouded by the flesh. It's clouded by sin. And then what happens invariably with that is you become forgetful spiritually. He puts them both together in this passage right here, looking back again in verse 9, he says, he cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. They go hand in glove. They go together. Uh, the lack of being able to see spiritually pro uh, properly uh, and thus then forgetting, forgetting 
are part of spiritual stagnation. Now, we know, we know from a spiritual standpoint what Peter is driving at here, that it all hinges upon spiritual growth. As I was looking at this passage, I, I, I thought of another place in Scripture that gives kind of a, uh, an illustration of what we're talking about here. I, I have found as we look at the Gospels, especially when it comes to Jesus Christ healing those that were blind, they seem to be almost hyperbolic. That they are illustrative of certain things. And I, I think there's a wonderful example of this in the book of Mark. Let's take a moment to look at Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, and this will be kind of where we close uh, the service here this evening. But in Mark chapter 8, we have a curious story uh, it's related to us unlike any other story in the Gospels. Uh, Jesus healed many blind people. But this one is unique in the way it is described for us. Uh, Mark either gives us details that others do not, or this is a, and I think this is really the, the reason, uh, it is a completely unique story of healing. But in Mark chapter 8 and in verse 22, the Bible says of Jesus that he cometh to Bethsaida. Now that is an important feature of this story, by the way. I think that if we understand where he is, we will further understand why he does what he does. But in the verse, he says, He cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. Obviously, they were intending for Jesus to heal this man by touching him. But that's not exactly what Jesus does, not at first. The Bible says in verse 23, he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Now, that's something that Jesus, nowhere else in the Gospels, does. He leads him out of the town. You think, well, why would he do that? The Bible goes on to say this, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. This is also unique. Now, Jesus healed blind men in different ways. Sometimes he simply says, you know, receive your sight. Uh, there's an instance where he made clay with spittle and put it on the eyes. This one, he spits right in the man's face. And then he asks a question that he doesn't ask in any other miracle. He never asks them, now, can you see okay? The Bible just says, boom, they can see. But here he asks the question. Now, keep in mind, Jesus never asks questions for his own information. He always asks it for our information. He's helping us to see something. He's wanting us to understand that there's something more here that you need to grab a hold of. But he says, do, do you see? And, of course, the man says, I see men as trees walking. In other words, I, not real good. Not real good. After he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. So this is, again, the first time that Jesus Christ also has to do uh, a double take, if you will. Has to work twice to get the same result. Again, it's not that Jesus Christ can't do it. It's not like, you know, in some of those video games, you're playing the video game and, you're, and your, your energy source is going... Like that, and you're losing power, and you have to go to one of these special places and get the power back. You know, and you get. You know, my my son way back when used to have one of those Xboxes, and he would be playing, and we'd. I never could compete with him because he was always so good. But you know, he he would have you know his energy would be in like so he have to go someplace to get that recharge and everything like that. It wasn't that Jesus Christ needed somehow to recharge his spiritual power and battery. You know. It wasn't like his spiritual ring all of a sudden need to be stuck in the stuck in the you know in in the in the in the book of the law and get all the power back again. It wasn't that at all. Jesus Christ, I think, is giving us some more things to chew on when it comes to how we receive our spiritual sight. And I think this is where it's going. That's why I say many times with these miracles, like related to sight. That there's more to it. And so he says, now, do you see? He says, yes, I, I see very clearly. And then in verse 26, he says this. 
neither he sent him away to his house neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town and that's the end of this particular story he says don't go back into town now he does do that on a couple of other occasions but here i'm wondering okay well now first of all why lord did you take him out of the town in the first place well in matthew chapter 11 we have the answer i think in matthew chapter 11 you recall jesus christ gives a warning on three cities the first of which was Bethsaida, then chorazin and then capernaum and he says woe unto you because if the miracles that were done in Tyre and Sidon or Sodom and Gomorrah were done, uh, or, or here were done there, they would have repented long ago. In other words, Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum were singled out as cities of Galilee in which Jesus Christ had performed many miracles, and yet the general population remained hardened to what was going on. They simply were not willing to receive the evidence and produce, let the Spirit produce faith. He says, listen, if I, if I took the same miracles that I performed here, and I performed them, and they were performed in these cities of ancient time that have long since been smoldering ash heaps, if they were done there before God judged them, they would have turned and repented long ago. So that was a, that was a censure upon these cities, and Bethsaida was the first one that was mentioned, and so I submit to you, that he brought them out of Bethsaida because it represented something that was injurious to his spiritual progress. This was not a healthful place for you to be. Now, again, I can't read too much into this, but I do believe from an application standpoint, it is very fitting. If we're talking about avoiding this nearsightedness as believers the first thing that is going to be important is that we allow the lord jesus christ to lead us away from the things that are hindering our sight things that are preventing us from seeing as clearly as the lord would have us to see sometimes our blindness is self-inflicted I think I've shared this when I was when I was a teenager. Uh, when we were back at our sending church, they they had two buildings, and the old building um, was kind of an education building, and they had they still had the old baptistry up there, and the insulation it was an old building, and so the insulation was not as good, and during the summertime, uh, it would get really warm up there. And as the winter months came on, flies, flies would gravitate toward the warmth of the upstairs in the baptistry area, and they would cover the windows. And me and my friend thought this was a great idea to take rubber bands, cut them, and then start kaboom, 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 smacking them and splattering them all over the windows. Kind of a stupid thing to do, but that's what we were doing. We thought it was great. And I remember one time I was going like this, and my finger, it slipped here and hit me right in the eye. Hit me right on the eyeball. And I had to wear a patch. I had to go to the, you know, the optometrist, and they said, yeah, you scratched the retina there, and you hurt your cornea or whatever it was, and, and so now you've got to have some ointment and a patch and so forth. That was a blindness that was self-inflicted. That was dumb, just being stupid, okay? And as Christians, sometimes we have a spiritual blindness because we do things that are dumb. We simply do not follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and as a result we find our spiritual vision dimmed. And Jesus sometimes wants, hey, I, can I lead you away from this? Can we just come away from this? Can we just stop the nonsense? And the Holy Spirit's saying, listen, there are certain things that you need to get rid of. Can we just lead you away from what is going to hinder you from growing spiritually? And as Christians, we have to pay attention to that of the Holy Spirit as parents sometimes to be able to look. Sometimes our children don't know what's best for themselves. You know, with the Thanksgiving dinner, all sorts of wonderful things to eat. I guarantee you, most kids don't go for the Brussels sprouts and the asparagus first. <laughs> all right! Spinach, my favorite. Let me get that. Uh, I'll get the turkey later, Mom. I just want all this uh, Brussels sprouts and all. You know, 
no, don't do that, you know. It's the turkey, it's the mashed potatoes, it's the gravy, it's the, the pumpkin pie and all that good stuff. You know, sometimes, no, 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 come back here. You don't have any vegetables. You don't have to touch the vegetables. Oh, okay, all right. Now now you go, okay, yeah. And can I have dessert? Have you finished it? No, no, you finish your vegetables, then you can have dessert, right? Yeah, that, that is, you know, sometimes as a spiritual parent, we say, you know, it, there's some things, you know, in and of themselves, it may not be bad, but, you know, Maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Or maybe we should put some limitations on it. Some boundaries as spiritual things. And so the Lord Jesus, allowing the Lord to lead us away from the things that, you know, they're, they're going to prevent us from growing spiritually. And again, they may not be bad in of themselves, but they're preventing us from growing spiritually. The second thing is that we need to let the Lord Jesus Christ humble us as long as it takes. Jesus Christ spit in this man's face. And when you spit upon somebody and especially in that culture in that culture that was i mean that that was humiliating and jesus christ spit in this man's face and the man didn't see it coming either i mean he couldn't cover himself he was blind he tries to come out <laughs> spit right <laughs> can you imagine can you imagine uh, is this jesus here or is this my brother i mean who, who just spit in my face right Jesus spit in his face, and then he touched him. And sometimes, sometimes our, 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 our Lord needs to get our attention by knocking us down a few notches. He did that with Peter, didn't he? He knocked Peter down a few notches. Peter says, I'll die for you. He says, don't crow too soon. Don't crow too soon. And so the Lord has to humble us and sometimes it takes a little while sometimes the message doesn't always sink in the first time and the Lord has to continue the process we're not seeing still quite the way you know we we want the lesson to be over so I, I'm fine now I see this oh do you what do you see well I see men as trees walking no, no, we haven't learned the lesson yet we need to work on this and then the third thing the third thing is to allow the Lord Jesus Christ at that point to direct us away from our past on into our future. You see, as Christians, we do have a future. Salvation is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end. And Jesus Christ told this man, now don't go back. Go home. Go home. This is where you belong. Go home. And as a Christian, if I would love for my eyesight to be what it needs to be, not allowing the flesh to draw me back, but to maintain an eye on the future. Paul says, listen, I, I, I forget those things which are behind, and I press forward to those things which are before. That's where I'm looking. That's where I'm going. Uh, we teach this to our kids as they were learning to drive. Where you are looking is where your car is going to go. Pat, you've been driving. You know that, right? You, you know, that when, when we, were, we were learning, you know, don't look at the hood. Because you know, that's where the temptation, right? You know, you're looking five feet in front of your car. Let's make sure I'm looking straight. No, you look down the road. You look down the road in advance. And, you know, say, hey, look at me. How are you doing? Because you, you, that's where you're going to go. <laughs> you keep your eyes where you want to go. And Jesus Christ says, this, this is where you are going. You, this is your future. Keep your eyes. As, as the writer of Hebrews says, looking unto whom? Jesus, the author, finisher. He began it, and he's going to finish it of our faith. That's where our eyes are. And as we look at that story in the book of Mark, I think it helps us to appreciate how it is possible as a Christian to regain uh, spiritual perspective and our spiritual vision to see things the way they really need to be as believers, seeing that this is not where it is. is. It, this, is this is just where I am right now, but I am a sojourner, a pilgrim, that's where I'm going. And so if that's where I want to go, then I need to be ready for 
the journey. I need to equip myself with the elements of the ladder of spiritual growth to be able to get where the Lord wants me to be. And He'll do it. He'll do all the work if we are simply willing for Him to do it in our lives. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that You bless as we close our service tonight. Grateful for being able to be together. Pray that You would use Your Word to minister to each and every heart, challenging us as we approach the new year, just a month away, to lay the foundation for a, a, a successful and fruitful 2024. And Father, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.